My name is Ruthie Henschel and you're listening to Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Hello and welcome to Eleven, the official theatre podcast that brings the biggest stars and creatives together in one place to discuss life in the arts. Our guest today is officially a staple of British musical theatre. In 1987, she made her West End debut in Cats and has earned an Olivier Award and five nominations for her performances on stage. In 1995, she took home the gong for Best Actress in a Musical for her role as Amalia Balash in the London revival of She Loves Me. She's also played the role of Polly Baker in the original London production of Crazy For You, Roxy Hart in the revival of Chicago, and the Tartar roles in the original productions of Peggy Sue Got Married and Marguerite, of which all of those also landed her Olivier noms. She made her Broadway debut in 1999 as Velma Kelly in Chicago, and far from finished with the show, she returned to the Broadway production to play Roxy Hart in 2010, and later Mama Morton in the West End production. She is the only British actress to play all three female roles in the show. And she returned to our shores to play the outrageously camp dance teacher Mrs Wilkinson in the West End production of Billy Elliot the Musical for around about two years. Audiences have also seen her play roles such as Fontaine in Les Mis, including the 10th anniversary concert, Miss Saigon, Oliver and A Chorus Line, to name but a few. She joins us today to talk through some of her most iconic and signature roles and tell us more about her upcoming UK solo tour, In My Life, which she casually premiered at the Sydney Opera House in June 2019 and went on to tour Australia playing to packed houses and five-star reviews. Please be upstanding and welcome to Eleven, Ruthie Henshaw. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I love the way you say casually premiered <laughs> at the Opera House. I didn't think of it like that, but yeah. It's a it's a pretty killer venue to kind Isn't of start it? with. Like, yeah. That's major. Yeah, I didn't even think of it like that. Is that the first time you've ever performed there? Yes. So you never ever, have you been there to see stuff or was that like, that was day one? That was day one. Wow. That, that must was have been one. crazy. Yeah. It was crazy, actually. It really was because, um, the, you know, it, it's the opera house, but we had huge problems with uh, sound. And so we didn't really get to even run the show. So it was it was kind of winging it. Yeah. Um, but that's when the best stuff comes out, isn't it? <laughs> is, it um, is it weird when you get to play venues like that? Because obviously it's so iconic and then you realise, oh, it's my turn to have a go here. Is that slightly terrifying or is that, so exciting you almost can't describe oh it's it's amazing because there are certain places that you really want to perform you know in england it's always uh the royal albert hall mm-hmm. everyone wants to play that uh it's sydney opera house and it's places like carnegie hall in new york in new york yeah so there are certain venues that 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 you know really um you just want to have stood there and sucked up a bit of the energy yeah do you, when you were in the middle of the show, did you have that kind of pinch me moment of, oh, this is really happening? Um, I did because also it was the, um, the, when we went, it was the, what do they call it? The Light Festival, the Festival oh, yeah. of Light. Yeah, Festival of Light, yeah. And the the opera house was completely lit up with the, with jellyfish and all sorts of marine life that had been projected onto it. And it was just beautiful yeah um so it, yeah it was a lovely time to be there as well how was it getting to i guess it's a different audience well it's not a uk it's not an american yeah. one it's this australia how is it getting to go to a country that from here seems quite a long way away but you go there and, and people love and know who you are and i guess want to come celebrate with you is that is that strange well yes because it is so far away <laughs> and you, you know you're you're convinced because remember um you know i came into the business pre-mobile phones you know yes. um we we still had video tapes not dvd recorders you know all of that and there was no social media there was n- none of that um so y- you know if if you hadn't performed on their doorstep you kind of figured people didn't really know who you were yep. um and now you know people can see anything and everything online so yep. that you've got fans where you didn't have any idea you had fans and fans where you didn't even think people knew who you were you know and is that the power of I guess album sales would have been oh I, I'd heard your voice on X album that's right that's right but it's not now you can post anything of course on YouTube or yep. any kind of social media and um, you know it, instantly you can see how many people have seen it yeah that's that's the crazy thing yeah definitely um, and uh, we you know Not only that, you then give everybody else the power to like it or dislike it. Well, yeah, you kind of open yourself up, don't you, to almost by default, but without actually kind of saying, yes, I want to do it, by kind of Mm. giving it your blessing when people 
either film stuff correctly or perhaps incorrectly during shows it's it's a weird time i think to be a performer because when do you think you first started to notice that shift happening in terms of i guess your performance like when did you start to see oh there's a clip of me singing x on online at a concert i did um oh that's yeah a bit strange yeah it was it, it, i i hmm. I reckon it was about 10 years ago okay. that I thought that I started to see I, I became aware that mm. people were posting stuff on this thing called YouTube. Um, and I was blown away by the kind of footage that was on there and realized that we it, it's it's no longer you can't get away with something. You know, if you if you muck up in something, it's there yeah. and somebody's videoed it. Um, I, I'm not very good on social media. I, I've only just gone on to um, Instagram. Only just. Do you like it? Uh, no, not very much. Okay. Um, I don't like any social media very much. And the the, the reasons being, um, if, if you allow yourself to scroll, you can get complete, you can lose so much time just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And by the time you finish scrolling, you have trashed your own life in such a major way and, and you feel like such a failure and so because everyone's posting their highlights. Yep. So there, there, there really is a sense for me. It's, it's not a good place for me to be because um, my head is not a good place for me to live. So, you know, I, I, I think it's... I th yeah, I think there's something very... Um, you have to be really careful about social media because you're you're just going to f sit there if you spend too long looking at it thinking that everybody else is doing what you're not mm. or um you know you know it's become about i mean i don't i don't look i don't scroll um you know, it's none of my business what other people think of me. Yeah. That's how I feel. Definitely. I, I think that's a really nice way to look at it. It's like it's almost not your opinion or kind of your interest to know what they think of you. And I, I think know. that makes it's hard in the world of social media to, to apply that theory. But I think that's nice. But do you find that when you started to notice those videos and a different way that people are interacting with you, that did it affect your performance? Do you think that you were conscious when you saw the little red dot or someone in that could be filming? Um... I never knew. Okay. I, I, I have to say I've very rarely seen that uh, actually happening. But um, I don't... Um, I, I, th I think it's just... It's difficult because you have no control. Yeah. And, you know, people on film and television, you know, before, and us in theatre as well, you could do it again if you wanted to retake something or you felt you'd, you know... But there's none of that now. Everything is instant and immediate. And, you know, th th that's just the way it is. Um, I don't particularly like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's a fair comment. I definitely think that's a fair comment. Uh, yeah, I, d I don't particularly like it. I mean, my kids are constantly sticking their iPhones in my face. And, you know, I, 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 I've been brought up in an era where, you know, you put your hair and makeup on first, you mm -hmm. know, before you actually have a photograph done or um and and you know at my age you really don't want a, an iphone stuck in your face and and um you know a video to be shot yep. um because these kids put them everywhere yeah how about um when you're i guess it's the slightly other side to this but when you're doing something like i watch i referenced in the introduction which was lame is the 10th anniversary when you know that it's being filmed and you know there's automatically an audience for it do you, is that then the other side of it, which is quite exciting, that your performance is going to be kind of there forever? Yes. that I mean, that is what people in the theatre really want, is these um, wonderful opportunities where what you've done is recorded, is documented, because it's gone. You know, you, every every night you say goodbye to a performance that that you that is live and instant and uh unique yeah and we very rarely get the uh we used to love it when people used to video at, at shows because it was the only way you ever got any footage of yourself was if somebody bought a big clunky video machine and, and you know but now of course they've got phones and you can you, you know you, you'll never catch them yeah do you um have you do you watch back the Lamez performance? You know the anniversary one. I did a couple of times actually. How did you feel about it? I felt the first time I saw it, I felt 
as nervous as I did that night. Okay. Because it was, you know, we had a 250 strong choir behind us. That, you know, it was the Royal Albert Hall. It was called the Dreamcast. It had, you know, people from all around the world being brought in. They were going to video it and, and uh, record it. And this thing got bigger and bigger and bigger. So when we got to the night, it really was quite terrifying in many respects because you had one go. Yep. Um, there were no repeats. Um, and so that it was scary from that point of view. But you knew you were part of something quite epic and quite unique. Mm. Because it never, I, did, I think I'm right in saying, but I don't think it had ever been done in concert before. Yeah, definitely. So, and I, and I still remember that as one of the best nights of my career mm. so far. I just loved it to, to have been a part of this, just this piece of history, which, you know, Le Miserable is anyway, a brilliant show. Um, and to be in the same room as those people that I performed with, you know, just, just the, you know, the cream of the crop of, of musical theatre at that time, and it was amazing. You referenced it was a dream cast, but it was a dream performance from you. Like people watch that; it's a real staple of of, of British theatre. It's an amazing performance, and I like the fact that you have such positive memories of it because so often people do those things and they hate them so much because there's so much pressure so it's nice to see you kind of smiling and enjoying talking about it it's, oh I loved it yeah. I loved it it was a wonderful evening and um the you know Cameron always gives a good bash afterwards but we had a, we had a wonderful party and then we ended up I can't even remember which it, it, um, it may have been Madame Jojo's it may have been somewhere else you know, singing around a piano till all hours of the morning as well after that. So, Because you've not done enough singing that day, have you? Not done enough. <laughs> but, yeah, because you're working towards something while you're rehearsing and then all of a sudden it's like somebody lets the steam out yeah. and, and we all just kicked off till about six o'clock in the morning, I think it was. What? Really? Hentral out till six o'clock in the morning? Yes, I was terrible. <laughs> I have friends who would say to me, you know, how can you come in and sing like that after what we did last night? You know, because we were always out on the town. Very quickly before we move on to something else, um, have you seen the new production of Les I have. Do you like it? I do. Yeah. I do. Um, I, I didn't think I would. Uh, not that I didn't think I would. I, I was fiercely uh, protective mm. of that original yeah. production. Um, but I think it's a beautiful, it's, it's beautiful. And, and it's Cameron Mackintosh. The man knows what he's doing. Yes. He doesn't get it wrong very often, mm. you know. So if he was going to change it and, and shake things up a bit, it had to be good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's exciting that that show of all shows is we get a new version of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think people are rightfully protective. Yeah. But it's exciting, definitely. Um, 20 years time, they'll bring back the barricade. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the revolve, revolve and the, the barricade. Revolve. Yeah. Yeah. It'll all start moving again. Things go in circles. Don't they? they put it in. It's amazing. You take it out. It's amazing. You put it back. Yeah. It goes in circles. Um, so the introduction was long because you've done some pretty epic and amazing things in your career. When you... I, whenever I do these introductions, people are like, it's a little bit embarrassing hearing everything back. You're like, oh gosh, I've done so many things. How do you feel about some of the things that I reference, like your five Olivier nominations and your Olivier win and some of the roles you've originated and been part of? I, do you kind of like going down memory lane or are you a little bit scared of it? No, I don't mind at all. I think we never take the time to think about those things, really. Um, we're always in, I think, in our business we're thinking about what's coming next mm -hmm. um is there when um and you're always having to reinvent yourself so you never ever stand there and appreciate what you've done and i remember this happening before every so often in life this kind of thing happens where somebody does an introduction for you and i was i was given a um i was pregnant with my first child and i was given an honorary doctorate at a um uh, at a university and I was uh, th this guy read out all my stuff and he'd also spoken to Cameron and a couple of other people to give a sort of an in introduction and I remember for the first time ever in my career so, so bearing in mind I was 34 um, I thought if I gave it up tomorrow I've done enough mm. I've done all right that's a great way to look at it 
That's a really great way to look at it. So I do, when I hear that, I think, because it's very easy to feel like just one of very, very many in a very huge business and, to, you know, to feel that you, you know, to hear that is, you know, you, th there are these moments where you can actually take a pause and go, oh, oh well, I haven't done badly. <laughs> <laughs> Understatement of the century, I mean, <laughs> for you, definitely. So when you were there thinking, right, theatre's what I want to do, was being a singing cat always the plan to start with? Was being in cats always the thing you thought, do you know what, I'm going to put some lycra on, I'm going to paint my face, I'm going to shake my bum, and that's basically going to be about cats. Was that the plan? Do you know, it's funny, because I saw that when it very first <laughs> opened. A friend of mine's father was an angel in it. And um, so I saw it in uh, right after it opened, and I remember thinking, I want to be in this, I'm going to be in this. Do you remember what it was that you liked? Um... Well, I was a dancer. Okay. I, I was training as a dancer. So mm. as a dancer, I mean, what a show. You yeah. know, you get to play. Um, you know, it's an ensemble piece. It's not like uh, being part of the chorus and everybody else is playing the lead. You know, you all had something to do in it. And uh, and so I, I was doing a chorus line on tour and the lady who looked after Cats had come to see the prose performance we did um, of a chorus line and she wrote to me and she said, would you come and audition for the part of uh, Jemima? So I was asked to come. I don't know whether I would have n even known about it because mm. I didn't have an agent at the time. Okay. I was literally just out of college. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think there are certain things in this life and this career that you are supposed to do. Yeah. You know, the costume won't fit anyone else. It's been made for you and you know, what's for you will not go by you. Yeah, definitely. Is it the sort of show that you now think I'd like to go back to? Do you want to do Grizabella and, and and do that now? Or do you think it's something that kind of belongs where it, it was? Um, I think to go back and do Grizabella would be, you know, incredible because it is such a... Um, th th there's that sort of full circle thing that comes every so often yep. that makes you feel like you've really... S sort of got everything out of it. Um, I, I I did. Um, I opened Miss Saigon in London, in the ensemble, and I closed it in on Broadway as yep. Ellen with Leia. And there was something really rather wonderful and a, a, and a privilege to be able to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there are times when, like going back into Chicago, every time. I mean, between R Roxy performances, was ten years. You know, I, I did Roxy, then I did Velma, then I did Velma, then I did Roxy again after 10 years. And my monologue and performance was completely different. I remember when I started rehearsals the second time and for, for, for Roxy and I thought, I remembered it was in me how I'd done it before. And I was suddenly aware this just doesn't fit me. This isn't this isn't who I am anymore. I'd had children. I'd, you know, there'd, there'd been 10 years of life. Therefore, as an actress, that sits in you. Yeah. And so you make different choices. Yeah. You know, with, with ha different acting choices, different choices all over. So th it is always a privilege to get to revisit something. When you've been in shows like Miss Saigon, you know, the Staples and Cats and... Um, when you then see other newer productions, obviously we had an amazing revival of Miss Saigon, when you get to sit through those shows again, is it strange? Is it slightly bizarre to get to... Because I imagine your mind goes back to, oh, I remember when I was in that and I remember what I was doing in that moment. And obviously you're, you're not doing it. Someone else is doing a different version of it. Is it almost like the, the best trip down memory lane that's also slightly strange because you're watching someone else almost live out what you did? Like, is, is it bizarre? Um, I, I just find it a joy because... Ha, you know, we get to revisit our past in a way that very few people in this life and world get to. Mm -hmm. um, music gives you such memories, instantly smells, you know, that kind of things, that when you have the chance to sit and, ha and, and see a show that you've been in, it's the most wonderful walk down memory lane, and that's how I... Yeah. That's always how I see it. Um... Sometimes you feel that maybe 
somebody or something isn't done the way you wanted it done or but it's different people it's different times it's you know it's it's just different yeah definitely and difference is exciting yes. especially in the world of theatre because so often we see the same yeah and i think that's what's exciting and i i was going to ask you next kind of about the different roles that you've done because they're all very different mm. obviously they're all within the realms of musical theatre but it's it's interesting that your roles are never the same i never feel like whenever i've seen you on stage I, or i've seen that from ruthie already is that kind of is that where you put your marker is that what you think well i don't want to do what i've already done i do actually want to probably cause myself a little bit more hassle which is by challenge myself every yeah. time is that always the plan it's well i think it's only because i'm drawn to you know certain things i've been offered things that I've thought, no, that's not me at all. Okay. Um, I've done that to death or whatever it is, you know, that type. Um, I really look at the script and go, does this excite me? What do I think? This, this, the script to me and the character is the driving force. Then I listen to, you know, the music. Then I listen to it's. It's sort of, it, I have to want to bite its hand off. Yeah, yeah. And you can't always know that these shows are going to be a success. You have no idea. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it. I I haven't. It hasn't been some master plan, but it's just I suppose because all oh, that's different. Oh, I like that. Or, you know, I th I think um, you know before Chicago, you know I was I was known for an awful lot of those pinafore parts and you know and dying and drama and that kind of thing and so I think that when my name was mentioned as you know going to play Roxy I think there were a few raised eyebrows it was like hang on a minute she doesn't do that she doesn't play bad girls and so it's really rather wonderful to um step in and do something that people are not expecting yeah it's it's interesting what you just said there because it's probably generational as to what we think like i the set the instantly when i think of you lame is does come definitely come up because of that anniversary recording because when i was first kind of falling in love with theater i watched that production so many times for lots of different reasons but also i think you was a very strong powerful lead on stage because of chicago yeah. whereas imagine you reference like you know perhaps the ingenue roles or the roles before that other people probably think of that of you so you really kind of have the best of i guess of every world it's yeah it's yeah. nice uh, it must be weird when people say oh oh I, I think of you like this you're like oh i never thought of that i never thought what you think of me no no never but mind you say saying that um even things like polly in crazy for you she was a, a tomboy so that the, there's all ruthie's always in there somewhere yeah and that's that's the best thing I imagine as a yeah. performer to get to see just a little little bit of yourself on stage. Because that's what we have that makes us unique. Yeah, definitely. Um, and makes us, you know, do something slightly different than the, the next person would do or had done. Definitely, hundred uh, percent amazing. Thank you very much. We're just going to take a quick break. Welcome back to Eleven. Ruthie Henschel is still here. Uh, we have mentioned lots of the different roles that you've done. One that I came to London before I lived here and saw you in was Marguerite. So I wanted to talk to you about that. Mm. How um, that show, I mean, how did that show change your life? Because it's an extraordinary, extraordinary piece. I thought it was an extraordinary piece too. It was phenomenal to be in the room while people are actually creating something and to be part of that blueprint was incredible. Mm. Michelle Legrand, uh, Bublé and, Schoen and Schoenberg, um, you know, Jonathan Kent directing. Yeah. It was it, it was a real, um, you know, the, one of those shows that you go, I cannot believe my luck. <laughs> uh, the set was just glorious. Um, it was really beautiful to be a part of. And, uh, you know, it was a new musical a brand new musical and that is what i think all of us really want is to be that person who creates the blueprint yeah um i did a play um in new york and uh, I, I you know my name was in the it was a, an original play and my name you know when they did the french and what is it the, when they the, when they actually first publish a play Oh, um... What they called, I've gone completely blank. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, it was David Ives' play uh, and there were two of us in the cast and it said, you know, Ruthie Henschel and, you know, and you're like, oh, my God, 
th 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 those first moments where you feel like you have helped because you are you are helping to create a piece somebody else has written it mm -hmm. but there are those moments like with marguerite where something's not quite working and so you sit down and you all go well how, what if and what what i feel i want to say is and you know and because jonathan kemp was writing the book and he would say yeah right okay well let's let's try it this way and put in that and and you know that's when you have to pinch yourself yeah. is I, I and sitting in the same room as Michelle Legrand, who, you know, Umbrellas of Sherborg, all of those incredible, you know, scores he's written. And he was just a beautiful man. He was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and to get an Olivier nom for your work in that must have just been, you know, the icing on a very, very special cake must have been yeah, an amazing moment. Yeah, I suppose when when... When somebody recognises something that you've done, um, it it is it is a privilege. It, it does feel good. You'd be a liar if you said it didn't. Um, it does feel good because there is so much that goes on in the theatre. Mm. You know, we have uh, you know an absolute you know smorgasbord of theatre here in England because we have uh, in in Great Britain because we have so many great theatres but we have you know the national and we have you know shakespeare and we have you know there's so so many incredible places so there's an awful lot going on so when you are in that small group that gets nominated it is a lovely feeling mm. um but also it doesn't mean that of course that there aren't people who didn't get in on it who you know did a phenomenal performance in something mm. so I, I i i don't know we we none of us are supposed to care about awards but you know it's really nice when you get them it's all right i it's imagine it's all right where do you keep your um your olivia win when you won where do you keep that now um it's that, actually it's it's holding uh, books <laughs> of course it is <laughs> it's, it's holding books on a bookshelf um but uh, the the plaque at the front the plaque thing is that what you call it, plaque? Yeah. Um, it's, it fell off. Oh. So it could be anybody's. Oh, well, can I have it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're like, have absolutely it. not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, before we started um, recording, when I was setting up, um, we were talking about our love of Billy Elliot. So I, I want to ask you about this show because it's. I think it might be my favourite show ever. And I, I know I Risky it. Business on a arts podcast kind of putting my mark in the sand and saying I love that show, but I really do. I think it's an extraordinary kind of movie stage adaptation that really kind of knows itself and owns its own space. Um, what was it like being in that show? Talk me through what it was like, because I was lucky enough to see you in the show, and apart from the fact it was the campus role ever, it was so much fun, it looked like it. Oh, yes, it was so much fun, and it was also, you know, they, they had that saying, you know, never work with um, children or animals. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I fell in love with all of those kids. They kept me... Uh, entertained the energy that they brought to that show every single night um, you know if there was ever a moment where you thought oh god I feel tired tonight I don't know I can do it you just look at the Billy Elliot and go oh, shut up and get over yourself you know <laughs> because there he was back flipping off the piano I think it is a uh, one of the most moving pieces of theatre um, that I've ever seen or been in the I grew up it was, the, you know, the backdrop to, to my um, Lane Theatre Arts. Mm. You know, it was right when I was there that minor strike was going on. Yep. And so um, to build this incredible story of strength, survival and, um, and talent that had the backdrop of the miners' strike, uh, it was very, very... It was huge to me, and it was. I remember it vividly, and I, and then to be a part of that, and and the the whole um, moment, one of the most moving moments for me. Well, there are many moving moments in that show, but the, you know, two that stand out for me is is when the the they're going down mm -hmm. in the lift again at the end, um, and the other one is when the father decides to go back to work because he wants to get his son out of 
you know, out of the situation he's in. And the only way he could do it was to go back and earn money. Mm. Um, you know, what we would do for our children in order to make a better life goes back to Miss Saigon. Yeah. Miss Saigon came out of, um, it was either Alain or Claude, it might have been Alain, seeing a, a picture of a mother handing over her child to the Americans as they were leaving, handing her child over. And it was a purely loving gesture. It wasn't, I, I don't want this child. It was the only way to get this child a better life is if one of these Americans takes this child home. And she was sobbing, handing her child over. And, you know, those, those things that we do for our own children that are completely... Uh, there is no self-interest in it whatsoever. It is entirely about that little human being. You know, that's a very powerful story. Absolutely. Do you think that that stayed with you when you became a mother? Do you think that that mentality and, and those roles have helped you become perhaps even a better mum? Do you think that that's... Do you think there has a correlation between the two? Um... um no, because I don't think that there is any preparing for being a mother ever. People can tell you, it's from the moment that you get pregnant, people will tell you their, their experiences of giving birth, which you really don't want to hear. Yeah. But they all love to tell you. Um, you know, then you get told that you'll never have sleep again and blah, 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 blah. And there isn't a blueprint. Every child... All of us are different and unique, and we come into this world, I think, with our own set of things we've got to do. I look at my two. Same mother, same father, could not be more different. So, and why is that? They've had the same upbringing. They've had, you know, the same parents. We are all different. We are all spirit-driven. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really difficult to ever parent full stop yeah. uh, because each time you know my eldest I've got a 15 year old and a 17 year old and every time that 17 year old gets to a new age I've never done it before and then the younger one comes up and she does it differently to the older one anyway so I'm starting all again yeah. it's just the problems get bigger the older <laughs> they get <laughs> so you're 15 and a 17 year old so did you do this tour to escape them is that what you've done you're running away no <laughs> I would never do that <laughs> um no they're, they're kind of old enough to take care of themselves really yeah so the tour is called in my life so yes. is the name a lemis reference no it's not I thought it was the lyric no? No. Oh, you're talking about In My yeah. Life. Da, da, da. No, this one is the Beatles song, In My oh, Life. Okay, why did you choose that? I loved the title. Um, I felt that there was an awful lot of stuff I was talking about that was about my life, not just about the career. So it re and, and I was singing this song. I love the sentiment of the, the, the Beatles song, you know. That, that there are there are so many things that we'll remember and if I go back to Bromley and Kent where I you know was born and brought up you know there'll be things that are there things that are not there people still there people not there um but there are you know just a a couple of people a handful at the most that you love no matter what and there's always one that y you will never love more. Mm. Nobody could, e you could never love anybody more than you loved that person. Absolutely. Is the tour an opportunity for you to meet audiences that have supported you through your career as well? Because as much as we're going to get to watch you sing these amazing songs um, and I imagine take a trip down memory lane, it's also a nice opportunity for you to to meet people as well and to get to I guess it works both ways right it yeah. must be it must be quite exciting to to get to meet the people that I guess have supported you always because you know people can come round to the stage door um, and that is what is great about the theatre you know they can come and say hello um, but I think that when you're doing this kind of thing it really is a very intimate show you mm -hmm. know I, there's there's an awful lot that's why I'm not playing big houses um, you just can't do this kind of show 
I want them to feel like they're in my front room. Yeah. And it, it is, you know, because you always meet them afterwards and um, there, there really is something lovely about being right in with them as opposed to in a West End theatre where, you know, set scenery, you know, orchestra, everything else is there. And, and, you know, if they can be bothered to wait at the stage door, that's fine. But this one, yeah, it really is. I'm, I'm right in there with them. Because <laughs> I guess it would be a little bit strange if midway through Miss Saigon you just started talking to an audience. And you know, it probably wouldn't work, would it? It wouldn't work. Whereas in your show, we get to see Ruthie in lots of different versions of you. Although I did, when I was in um, a Billy Elliot, I was doing the letter with the Billy yeah. and I could hear this snoring going on. And I was it was so loud. I can't tell you how loud it was. Yeah. And it was right in the front row and um, it was going on and on and on. And it was really, you know, really mucking up the scene. So in the end, I turned and I and I said, um, you know, in a Geordie accent, you know, could could you just give up on there a, a shove? <laughs> and um, to the person sat next and they were shoving, 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 nothing. And I said, could someone get him a room for the night? <laughs> um, just so I could try and get somebody from the, the theatre to wake him up or something because the little boy he had this wonderful moment and, and this heartfelt song and this loud <laughs> was going on anyway bless him it turns out he was in a diabetic coma oh my gosh yes absolutely I mean he was you know having a turn and nobody did anything about it apart from you yeah you were... um, so <laughs> that gosh for you <laughs> so basically they took him outside and called an ambulance yeah but he was mortified, bless him. Yeah. He was so concerned. We were like, for goodness sake, you don't need to apologise. You couldn't help it. He said, I'm so con- I'm so sorry if I if I disturbed the performance. We're like, bless you, honey, but you were having a... Di- you were in a diabetic coma. I think we forgive you. Yeah, I think that one's a, a free pass, I think, for, for making a little bit too much noise. In yeah. The, um, the tour, so... Talk me through songs that we can expect, or perhaps just a couple of hints so we don't give too much away. What sort of things are you going to be covering? Um, there's, a, uh, there's a couple of sort of Liza Minnelli numbers there, the sort of lesser known. Um, there's some more modern musical songs. There's some songs from musicals I would like to have been in but would never have been able to be in. OK. Um, there are... Uh, there's really very, very few songs that I've done before. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't done before. And that's on purpose, really, because I have sung certain songs enough. Go on YouTube. <laughs> we spoke about it at the start. Yeah. If you want I Dreamed a Dream, you know where it is. You've got to go on YouTube. <laughs> and it's Unless I've... I can do it differently. And, mm. um, you know, that... There are a few, you know, a couple of nice surprises and sort of... But, you know, I need to find a different way to do those songs if I'm going to do them now, you know. Does the... Because uh, I was reading the kind of little description about the show and it said Carol King and Victoria Wood. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. Because that was like, what, what's she going to do? Because Carol King's another one of my absolute faves. So I'm now go, trying to go through her back catalogue and try and... Can you say what you're going to sing? Oh, no? I, well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's... It, there was the incredible show Beautiful, wasn't yeah, there? which so, I loved. It yeah. was sensational. So it's, you know, they've they've been picked up and made bold, yeah. uh, you know, in a way that I thought was brilliant. Um, Victoria Wood, I grew up with Victoria Wood. I, I say grew up. I grew up in the theatre mm-hmm. with Victoria Wood because uh, she had the Victoria Wood as seen on TV. And Anybody who's in musical theatre can, can, you know, word for word, do any one of those sketches. Um, and I loved her. I think she is a genius. And I'm so sad that we lost her. And she knows how to write a funny song. And she knows how to write a funny song that can be really cheeky and risque, but it's never crude. Yep. It's never unpalatable yeah it's just funny and cheeky yeah the best victoria wood song line ever is 
have a, another custard cream and shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, I, which well, is from Akon Antiques, Akon Antiques the musical. And it's, she came to a production that I did and it was just like, the fact she was there, it was like with the glow, the halo around her. Yes. But just, and you could hear her. It was quite, it's quite, complete side talk, but the people that worked in the theatre that we were doing the production of told her to stop filming her own show. And I don't think she said quite as many words back. She was kind of like, it's my show, love. Like yeah. I do what yeah. I want, but just just sums up how amazing she is. And and but that lyric, always keep that in my head and think, yeah, it's it's genius writing. I, but I don't think you'd ever get that again. Like I no. think it's just well, she once wrote in the drama, lifetime. comedy, yeah. m- um, musicals, d- you know, TV, film. It, it, th- there is nothing that woman didn't do yeah. and do it brilliantly. brilliantly. It wasn't. It, she didn't just have a go. She you know succeeded yeah she's amazing she's absolutely amazing let's talk about um roles that you would like to play that you haven't yet is there anything that you've still got on your wish list or because you kind of referenced earlier is there anything that you thought about playing but didn't play or would would have wanted to play that became huge oh i think i would have loved to have um done mary poppins oh you would be amazing in that actually yeah it was between myself and laura michelle kelly and they they went young and um, and I remember being really gutted about that. But instead of that, because I didn't get it, um, I had Dolly, my youngest daughter. Mm. So, you know, it, it really isn't an issue in any way, shape or form because, you know, I look at Dolly and I wouldn't have her mm-hmm. because you you don't know... I don't know whether I would have had another one because what what that would have led on to, you, you just never know. A child or a flying umbrella. Mm. Mm. You, you might have lost a little bit with a flying umbrella, but I, I see the point. <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the child. <laughs> my, my final two questions for you. Um, what do you think that being in this industry and all the amazing things that we've discussed today has taught you about yourself? I think I'm a lot more resilient than I think I am. Um... And I, yeah, I can't believe, I still can't believe my luck that I get to do what I do for a living. You know, if I ever complain, slap me hard because it's just, you know, sh- you know, shame on me if I ever complained. But, um, yeah, no, I, I think that, I've I've realised I'm very resilient, but I'm also a, a, a lot more vulnerable than I would like people to know. Hmm. That's um, that's a very honest, I think, look at yourself, but important as well. Mm. I think to be able to self-evaluate that much, it feels important. And my very final question, which is, I guess, of similar ilk, but career highlights is a, I think, a bit of a weird question to ask people because certain things mean certain things to lots of different people but tell me about the moment where you thought this is where I'm supposed to be this is this is it for me uh I think definitely um it would be the opening night of crazy for you um many many things happen I knew something was about to change in my life I knew it and I could feel it and 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 it wasn't just I'd got a lead role and it was going to be a great show. I, I, I knew that something was shifting and changing. And um, it's sort of the, the opening night. I remember um, getting to the party and it was one of those moments where I turned round to go down the stairs into the party and everybody turned round, the whole party turned round and started applauding as I came down the stairs. And I remember thinking, this is like something out of Film. This is insane. Um, and it was a night I will never, ever forget. You know, the the your tickets were dance cards with a pencil on and you had to fill them in. It was a big band. Um, and I got to dance with my dad, proper, you know, a proper, to a proper big band. And... Um, I've got a photograph of that and it will always remain one of the most special moments in my life was feeling that that my parents that there there was something I was showing 
now for all <laughs> the, all they put me through and all the money that they paid and you know that it must be a wonderful feeling as a parent to to watch your child succeed mm. in something that they love well definitely yeah. what a moment that must have been for them as well as you yeah amazing yeah i don't think i've seen you smile as much in the whole podcast i can tell that really <laughs> meant a lot um ruthie it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you thank you so much for coming on 11 i really appreciate it pleasure um i should say that your solo tour in my life begins 11th of april i do believe at the lowry so um tickets are at ruthie so go check those out i can't wait to see it but just thank you so much again pleasure You've been listening to Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Find out more about Eleven at club11.london or via our official social channels. 